Well, once again, good morning, First Baptist. It's good to see you, good to be back with the church family. Pastor Marcus did a great job of bringing the word last week uh, and that Father's Day theme. And he may have mentioned, and some you of you know, that I was away last week. I was actually at a baseball game. I was at a lot of baseball games last week. And um, something I'm going to do throughout the summer. In fact, this summer... It kind of occurs to me that this summer I have the two greatest jobs in the history, history of, the world. of the world. I, I kid you not. I have the two greatest jobs. Number one, I get paid to watch and talk about baseball. How cool is that? I get paid to watch and talk about baseball. So if you don't know what I'm talking about... Um, so this summer, I am the radio voice of the Midcoast Dungies. American Legion baseball team, high school kids, 15 through 19 years old, playing a pretty intense summer schedule, and we're broadcasting all 30 of their games, and I get to be the voice. I get to follow young men around, watch them play baseball, and talk about it. That is a great job. But even better than that is my other job. The greatest job, and I've always thought this is the greatest job ever. I get paid to read and talk about the Bible. How cool is that? I love to tell the story. I love to talk about the Word of God. I love just to be in it and, and look at it and then talk about it and open it up and just hopefully you enjoy the same enjoyment that I get when we look at the Word. We want to start today a new series. We wrapped up a couple weeks ago our look at 1 John and that theme. We love to tell the story of the real Christ because John in his letter just kind of unfolds and, and addresses some of these misconceptions that if you think that Jesus is anything other than the eternal self-existing God who came in the flesh, you're not looking at the real Jesus. You're not looking at the real Christ. And you might call yourself a Christian, but you're not really a Christian if the Christ that you claim to follow is anything less than the eternal self-existing God who came in the flesh. That was our theme in 1 John. So this morning we're going to start a new series in the book of Malachi. And in the book of Malachi, we're going to borrow that same theme. We love to tell the story of the faithfulness of God. As I mentioned when we looked at our memory verse, that really kind of is the... Uh, summary verse of the book of Malachi, because Malachi is going to go through and give several indictments against God's people. But behind that, the backdrop of that is God saying, but I don't change. And therefore, my promises to you are still sound. My promises to you still remain, even though he has to rebuke them and uh, address some, some pretty serious issues that are going on that had crept in to his people again. So the book of Malachi, Mal where, where in the world is Malachi? Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. You remember the Word of God is made up of 66 individual books. First part of that, uh, we divide it in two halves. The Old Testament is from the very beginning up to Malachi, just leading up to the time of Christ. And then the New Testament is Jesus all the way through to the end of all things. Malachi is the last book of the New Testament. So there's more books in the, I'm, I'm sorry, last book of the Old Testament. Um, there are more books in the Old Testament than the New Testament. So, you know, it's about two-thirds of the way through. Uh, open your Bibles if you're at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Back up. It's just before Matthew. It's Malachi. And uh, we want to take a look at this book and just enjoy that. There's some, some background things that we want to know here as we get in. But look at what we're, what we're reading here. This is Malachi, and uh, we want to look at the first five verses this morning of the book of Malachi. Here's how it reads in the New American Standard translation of the Bible. The oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord, yet I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau. And I have made his mountain a desolation and appointed his inheritance for the jackals of the wilderness. Though Edom says we have been beaten down, but we will return and build up in the ruins. Thus says the Lord of hosts, they may build up, but I will tear down and men will call them a wicked territory. 
and the people towards whom the Lord is indignant forever. Your eyes will see this, and you will say, The Lord be magnified beyond the borders of Israel. Now, that sounds just kind of really cryptic here, and it's even kind of hard to understand where is he going with that. But as we start to unfold that, it makes sense. A couple things we want to know as we begin to unfold that passage is just one, this, this burden of Malachi. The burden of Malachi. In fact, let's look at that name Malachi. He's kind of the unknown prophet. Because it's interesting, in verse 1 of Malachi, this is the only place where that name is ever mentioned in the Bible. Now, a little later in verse or chapter 3, verse 1, there's a related word, and it's translated messenger. But this is the only place where the name Malachi is given, or perhaps the title Malachi. Because Malachi means messenger. It's the Hebrew word for messenger. And just like the, the Greek equivalent of that, angelos, can mean angel or it can mean messenger. Somebody, a, a human being who delivers a message, Malachi or angelos, depending on if you're giving it in Greek or Hebrew. And, and so it's the same here. So that leads to some really interesting speculation on the part of some Bible students that maybe this is not the individual's name, but maybe it's just his title. He is the messenger. So why doesn't he name himself? Maybe he wants to remain not anonymous, and he just shows up and says, you know, I'm the messenger. I just have a message for the Lord. My name is unimportant. I just have this message for you. And so if that's the case, then there's further speculation of, well, who is it then? Can we, can we determine who it is? Maybe it's one of the other prophets that were in the area at that time. Maybe it's, maybe it's Ezra. Maybe it's Nehemiah. Maybe it's one of the other contemporary prophets. Or some, just maybe going a little further in that speculation, say, well, maybe, you know, as that name suggests, it could be a human messenger or it could be an, an angelic being. Maybe this, is, maybe this message is so heavy and so important that God sent an angel to deliver the message. And so maybe we should read that. Here's the oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel through the angel. My approach and my philosophy is that the, the simple approach is usually the best approach. I think this is a man who was named Malachi that we know really nothing about. But God used him to deliver this message. But even more important than, uh, than that title or that name Malachi is this word oracle. The oracle of the word of the Lord. And that word oracle means the burden. The heavy message. This is a heavy message. It's a burdensome message. And we could look at that maybe in a couple ways. It's a heavy message because this is really important. It's heavy in the sense that we just really need to pay attention to this and heed this message. This is so important. This is the oracle of the word of the Lord. This is heavy. But we might also look at that in terms of, of this idea that this is a heavy message in the sense that this is a difficult message. It's difficult to deliver. And in that sense, it's difficult to hear. Think about that. Just kind of stop and pause and let your imagination go. And we think about some of those Old Testament prophets who got up and who spoke for the Lord. And sometimes we just picture them as fire and brimstone kind of preacher guys that just love to lay it on the people. But I wonder if that was always the case. When you think about a, a Jeremiah or an Elijah, Isaiah, you know, if, if they had a message and the God said, God said, you know, here's what I want you to declare to the people. And, and that man of God would say, wow, ooh, that's, that's pretty serious. I, I don't know if I'm comfortable saying those things. I, I don't want to say those things. That's a heavy message to deliver. I, I just hesitate to do that. And maybe that's the case here. Maybe this man, Malachi, was tasked by the Lord to deliver this message. And he said, you know, this is heavy. I, I, this is hard for me to say to these people. And in that same sense, this is a hard message to hear. It's not always easy to hear a rebuke. It's not hard to receive that and to receive that graciously and to receive that 
productively and let that change your life. It's a hard message to deliver and it's a hard message to receive. But here's the point that we want to understand. Sometimes, sometimes the things that are the most difficult for us to hear are the things that are the most needed. Or maybe turn that around. The thing that we most need to hear are the things that are the most unpleasant to hear. Sometimes that's true in the Word of God. The Word of God isn't always light and fluffy. It is not always a feel-good message. Sometimes when we read the Word of God, we feel like we've been, we've been beat up a little bit. But maybe that's what is the most needed. Sometimes the thing that we most need to hear, those words of encouragement, Instruction, the words of encouragement, the words of rebuke and correction are at first and initially difficult to hear. And you know, that kind of fits with the theme of this book. And by the way, God takes no delight in that. God is not a God who delights in beating up his people. There's a verse in uh, uh, Ezekiel, it's chapter 33, verse 10. Some of our, our kids' club kids memorize that this year. But the verse says, I take no delight in the death of the ungodly. Therefore, repent, the Lord says. God doesn't love to deliver these messages, but he loves us enough to deliver the message because that's what we most need. So that's what we're going to look at. But before we go any further in the book of Malachi, we just kind of need to understand where this fits in in the history of Israel, where it fits in in that whole story of God's revelation of God making himself known. And that's what this is, by the way. This is the record of God making himself known to creation. So we, we know it's in the Old Testament, but where in the Old Testament does it fit? So we want to go back. We haven't done this for a long time, but just kind of that, that history of the Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi in a couple minutes or less. So here, you ready? Here we go. In the beginning, God. You got to start with God. It's the first words of the Bible. It's the first understanding. If you don't start with the foundation of God, nothing else makes sense. In the beginning, God, and the Bible doesn't try to explain God's origin because it's unexplainable. But in the beginning, God, and that's where we start. And then Genesis describes first four beginning things. That's what Genesis means, the beginnings. Things. Four important events. It's the creation of the world. It's the fall. It's how sin entered into the world. It's the flood of the world, that worldwide flood. And it's the beginning of nations. And then Genesis introduces us to four important individuals. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Those are the patriarchs. We, we follow the story of Joseph and, and realize that 70 people followed Joseph into Egypt. And how long were they in Egypt? 430 years. 70 people followed Joseph into Egypt. A nation followed Moses out of Egypt. After 430 years, those descendants, that family of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph multiplying in Egypt, after 430 years, a nation follows Moses out of Egypt. They came to this place called Kadesh, a Kadesh oasis, and that's where, where Moses sent the spies into the land. They came to the Kadesh oasis. They would not cross. Remember this, the, the account of the spies going into the land, one from each tribe of Israel, and they were sent into the land to scope out the land, and those 12 went in, and they saw the land, and it was huge, it was big, it was pleasant. But 10 of them came back with a report to say, as wonderful as it is, we could never take that land. It could never be ours. The people in the land are too strong for us. We could never possess that. But two of the spies, who are the two spies? Joshua and Caleb. Two came back and said, no, we trust God. God said that's going to be our land, and so we trust him. So two came back with the report. But the people refused to cross over, came to the Kadesh Oasis, would not cross, so they got to wander in the wilderness. How long were they in the wilderness? Forty years. They finally, God brings them back to the Jordan River, and they crossed over. And then they began that process of conquering the land. And as they conquered the land, the people were ruled by judges. And in, those, in that record, there, there's a cycle of judges. And that cycle, we just see it repeated over and over again, that they, they got comfortable. But comfort led to 
complacency. And complacency led to compromise. And compromise led to corruption. And corruption led to chastisement from the Lord. And their life was hard. And they called out and God sent them a champion to deliver them. And they became comfortable. And comfort led to complacency. How many cycles of judges? Seven cycles of judges. And after going through that seven times, finally the people are crying out and they want a king. And so finally God relents and he gives them a king in Israel. Who's the first king of Israel? Saul. Oh, no heart. No heart for the Lord. Who's the second king of Israel? David. Whole heart. Who's the third king in Israel? Solomon. Half heart. And it's just interesting to watch the development of his life. At first he has a heart for the Lord, but as he ages and as he progresses in his reign as king, his heart is turned away from him. After, after Saul and David and Solomon, then there's a divided kingdom. Northern kingdom of Israel. Israel. Got to do it this way. Northern kingdom of Israel, 10 tribes, 19 kings, all of them bad. Capital city is in Samaria. They are finally taken into captivity to Assyria. Southern kingdom of Judah, two tribes, 20 kings, some good, some bad. Capital in Jerusalem. Eventually taken into captivity into Babylon. How many years were they in captivity in Babylon? 70 years. Then they returned to the land. As God promised, returned to the land. Rebuilding the temple. Then they rebuilt the wall. And then there were silent years. How many silent years between the speaking of the prophet until the coming of John the Baptist. 400 silent years. That's where we are. That was a long way to say this is where Malachi is. Malachi is the last word from the Lord through the prophet before the coming of John the Baptist. This is the last word of the Lord before those silent years. But as we understand that and just recognize the history that they have that whole history of, of seeing God at work and the stories and and the traditions and what they have heard from their fathers and what they've gathered and gleaned that they should know they're back in the land temple has been reestablished and as we're going to see as we unfold this that the temple worship has been reestablished and they're still a subjected people they're still under the domination of the Persian Empire at this point but they enjoy some, uh, some self-rule. And in that self-rule, they became comfortable. And we know that comfort leads to complacency. And complacency leads to compromise. And compromise leads to corruption. And that's where we are again. And that's why the prophet calls them out. So in this book, this is God, through his prophet, making some declarative statements to the people. This is what I say. And the people respond by disputing what God says. We're going to see that pattern seven, seven times or seven or eight times in this book where God makes a statement, but the people dispute it. And in that dispute of God's statements, we see really the characteristic and the hardness of their heart. That's where we are as we look at Malachi and that first statement, I have loved you, says the Lord. And the people say, how have you loved us? How have you loved us? Now first, just look at the first part of the statement. I have loved you. That, that should have been a statement of encouragement. That should have been a foundation of encouragement. Even if rebuke and correction follows that, that should have been a, a reassuring statement. As if to say, God through the prophet is saying, now just remember, first and foremost, you are mine. I love you. I chose you. You didn't do anything for that, but I chose you and I love you and I continue to love you. And by the way, when it says, I have loved you, that's not something that was once true. It's something that was true and is true. It's one of those verbs that has a starting point, but a continuing action. I have loved you, said the Lord. I determined that I was going to love you, and you've seen evidence of that. And I still love you. And it should have been an encouragement for them, but they didn't take it that way. It should have been a foundation for encouragement, even if he has to say afterwards, now remember that I love you, but there's some things we need to correct. I love you and you are my people, but you're not where you need to be. And so we're going to address these things. But, but foremost, first and foremost, just know you're still my people. And I still love you. 
should have been an encouraging statement, but they disputed that declaration. It's interesting to read this. I, I wonder, how, I just sometimes like to imagine what was the tone of voice as the prophet delivered that message. I wish we could have heard it. I wish we could have heard the response to the people or of the people. And, and we read it this way, I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? Now, we could read this as a response to, as the people just in, in response and the, kind of that meditative response, well, how has he loved us? Like the poet, let us count the ways. I have loved you, said the Lord, and the people said, wow, how has he loved us? Let's stop and think about that for a minute. And it could have been that meditative, but that's not the way it is. Context tells us it was not that response. In fact, I just imagine that, that as the prophet delivers that, in, in that mix, there is maybe this, this sarcastic, maybe this accusative voice. Maybe a voice of contempt. I have loved you, declares the Lord, but you say, yeah, right. You've loved us. How have you possibly loved us? Have you seen what's going on here? That we are in the land and it, it's not good. Sure, it, it, we're not in captivity, but there's been a long time since blessing. And even just kind of reading into that and understanding as we go through the book, that they were continuing with the temple worship. And we could even imagine them saying, yeah, right, Lord, you love us. And we keep doing that religious stuff. We keep doing all of the requirements, but we get nothing from you. It's been a long time since you've blessed us been a long time since we've seen anything from your hand and you say you love us yeah right how have you loved us God made a declaration and they disputed the declaration and in that dispute of declaration they really reveal their heart that revelation of heart is that they were doing everything that they needed to do but there was no response there was no answer from God I want to just stop there and use this as a checkpoint for our own hearts and our own attitudes. That checkpoint to say, do we sometimes demonstrate that same questioning, disputing heart? And maybe the attitude, as you see it on the screen, maybe the attitude is this, that we come to somehow this skewed understanding that, that when life is good, it's our doing. That's kind of where they were at. We, what we have and what we enjoy is because we've had to work from it. When life is good, it's our doing, and when there's calamity, well, that's from God. Yeah, you love us. How have you loved us? So the prophet answers that question. Quickly, we'll look at those answers, and that's really what that, the rest of those verses are about. He reminds them of their history. He reminds them of the past pre preferences. Look at this. I have loved you, verse 2 says, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? Here's the past preference. Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord, yet I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau. Now, this, this is interesting to talk about. He goes back to their history. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. The children of Israel, your fathers. That God so God, says, I chose to love Jacob. I, I just chose him. And Esau, his twin brother, he says, I hated him. Now, does that bother anybody else? Kind of makes me feel uncomfortable. I, I look at that and say, not fair. That is not fair. And so my, my first response always, well, maybe, maybe I need to look up that word in Hebrew because maybe it doesn't really mean hate. I want to soften a little bit. So I look up the word, guess what it means? Hate. Can't get around it. God says, I loved Jacob and I hated Esau. And I say, that's not fair. And that's exactly the point. You know, something we need to understand here and keep in mind. God is not limited to what we think is fair. God's not limited to our sense of fairness. He's not limited to our sense of what is right and what is wrong. And we struggle with that. But we have to realize that he is God and we are not. Even if it doesn't set well, we have to go back to that foundational understanding that he is God and we are not. And by the way, if we try 
to insist, and we think that God must act according to our sense of right and wrong, then he ceases to be the ultimate authority. Think about that for a minute. That, that's huge. If we think God has to act the way we think he should act, if he has to act according to what we think is right or wrong or fair or even, then we're saying, God, you don't decide that. We decide that. And if we're saying that God has to act according to what we think is best, he ceases to be the ultimate authority, and we become his authority. And if we try to make ourselves his authority, we repeat what Adam and Eve did all the way back to the beginning. God says, here's the way it's going to be, and here's good, and here's bad. And they said, we're going to decide for ourselves." So when we come to these elements that just seem a little bit unfair to us, we have to say, yeah, but I don't understand what God understands. And so I'll trust that he is God. But you know what? That in itself is the very point. God says, go back to your beginning, and I chose to love Jacob and his twin brother I didn't love. I didn't love him. And you know what? Neither of them did anything to warrant it one way or the other. I just simply chose to love you, and that's your past. That's your history. I chose to love you. And then we think about their present condition. And that's really what he's getting at here. Look at verses 3 and 4 with me. But I have hated Esau, and I have made his mountain a desolation and appointed his inheritance for the jackals of the wilderness. Though Edom says we've been beaten down, but we will rebuild. We will turn and rebuild up, <laughs> build up the ruins. Thus says the Lord of hosts, they may build, but I will tear down. So in essence, God is saying, okay, look at your present condition. You see, both of those people, both of those nations kind of had a similar path. Edom that he mentions here is the nation that came out of Esau. Both those brothers, Jacob and Esau, became fathers of nations. Jacob became the father of Israel. Esau became the father of Edom. They both had generations that became a nation, both established in the land. Both of them were taken into captivity, either by the Assyrians or the Babylon, Babylonians. One returned. There really is no record of the Edomites coming back in mass and being reestablished in the land. Now, they may have trickled back. That, that edict that allowed the Israel to come back also covered all, all those others that deported people. And they may have trickled back into the land, but there's no record of Edom being reestablished and taking hold again. In fact, some people look at this verse, these, this inheritance becoming a place of the jackals of the wilderness some look at that just as the nomadic people that came and inherited the land and maybe that was the fate of the edomites themselves they came back to the land but they were just they were nomadic they were never reestablished. and so in, in pointing that out god says this you ask how i loved you and how have i loved you well where are you right now here's the answer where are you you're back in your land your temple's been rebuilt you're working on getting the wall rebuilt where are you because my hand is still upon you because my promise to you is still sound. And in the same way, we could look at that next verse. And this is, this is a little tougher just to kind of work through. But really what he's pointing to is that future hope. Though Edom would say we've been beaten down, but we will return and build up the ruins. Thus says the Lord of hosts. They may build up, but I will tear down. And men will call them a wicked territory and the people towards whom the Lord is indignant forever. Your eyes will see it. And you will say, the Lord be magnified beyond the borders of Israel. Now, the timing of that, it's not really clear what timetable in the future he's talking about. But he says, here's what's going to happen. They're going to be torn down. People are going to call that a despised territory. And where are you going to be? You're going to be here. You're going to see it. You're going to still be here. And you're going to see that I favored you and not them. Now, when is that going to happen? That may be an indication of when Christ returns. It may have been some time after that, up to this point. It still may be future. But the promise is this. You're going to still be around. You're still around. How have I loved you? I have loved you by keeping you intact. Although you had to go into captivity, I kept you intact. I loved you by bringing you into the land. I kept you intact. I love you and will continue to love you, and you will be intact. And you know, the lesson here 
two really important lessons is that God is not finished with his people, by the way. You know why? Second important lesson. When God makes a promise, it is as he is. It's eternal. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, sons of Jacob, are not consumed. That's the whole theme of the book. We could look at that and ask the same question. Because it's applicable for us. And although this was addressed to a certain people at a certain time in a certain situation, we know that the heart of God is consistent. And, and, you know, we could take that message and God would say to us, I have loved you. And we might ask, hopefully not mockingly, how have you loved us, God? And God would give us the same answer. Well, think of your past preference. I simply chose to love you. I've chosen you. I chose to love you and to make that love known. And I demonstrated that love to you in that while you were still rebelling against me, Christ died for you. You didn't do anything to earn it. You don't merit it. Sometimes you make it pretty obvious that you didn't earn it. But I chose to love you. And think about your present condition. That when we embrace Jesus as Savior, we are held in his hands. I just appreciate the verse that Pastor Marcus shared with us. That grace is baptism. What a joy. We are in his hands and no one or no thing can snatch us out of his hands. Where, where are you? You are in Christ. Where is Christ? He's seated at the right hand of the Father and we are in Christ and we are held secure in his hands. That's the promise that is secure. And God says, I, the Lord, do not change. So he's not going to change his mind about those he has called his own. And how do we know he loves us? Because he's given us a future and a hope. We have that future promise. The promise that is applied even now, they promised he will never leave us or forsake us. He will never abandon us. He will never be unaware of where we are what we go through. He's promised that his love will continue to cover us even if we don't like the circumstances we go through. And it's a promise that continues. We have a promise of heaven. We have a future and a hope. And as messed up as this world gets, we know that this is not the final story. We have a hope. Amen. That's all because of Christ. It's all because of the death of the burial, and the resurrection of the one who took our place and paid our penalty. And by the way, if you don't know that Savior, this would be a good day to embrace him as your Savior. We're going to work through the book of Malachi and look at some of those other declarations and, and disputations of the declaration. But behind all of that is this faithfulness of God. And we love to tell the story of the faithfulness of God. Father, we do. We thank you that you are a God who never changes. We thank you that you are a God who is eternal. We thank you that you are a God who keeps his promises, and we cling to the promises that we have in Jesus. We thank you that we can know with certainty that there is salvation, and we, we would take comfort and hope in that even as our world crumbles, as things are more and more messed up. We know that you are always the same. We thank you for that reminder from your word, and we pray that as we leave this place, that that word would continue to be our source of hope and comfort. And we would pray also, Father, for an opportunity to share that message with a world that loves us. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.